Mario Party. The game that single-handedly ruined more friendships than Monopoly and broke more TVs than Wii Sports Bowling. For the past two and a half decades, these games have been the arbiters of chaos, misery, and just plain fun. Or, at least, they were, because it seems like in recent years, Nintendo has forgotten how to make a Mario Party game. 9 and 10 were fun, I guess, but the weird car gimmick removed any illusion of strategy, and Super Mario Party was good, but at only four boards, and let's be honest, that Gold Tower one is the only one you ever play, it got old kind of quickly. Except for the rhythm mode, that is the single greatest piece of code ever written. At the time of writing, Nintendo has recently announced a new game in the franchise, Mario Party Superstars, but from what we've seen so far, this seems more of like a throwback, a collection of a bunch of old boards and stuff from the game's history. Now, that's all well and good, but seeing as it's been 14 years since the last truly great new party was held at the Mario household, I think it's about time I have a go. So, Nintendo, I hope you got your notepads ready because here are my wishes for the next new Mario Party game. Before I get into the wishes though, I think it's important to establish why some Mario Party games work and others don't. You see, just like Monopoly, whether you want to admit it or not, at its core, this game is entirely, and I mean seriously, 100% based on chance. And that's a good thing. The past few Mario Party games have focused more on cooperation, but that's so contrary to what makes these games so beloved. Forget the cars, forget the like river rafting and the weird doubles modes things. People don't play Mario Party to make friends, no. They play it to feel, just for a moment, what it truly feels like to want to murder your friend. With that in mind, let's see if we can create the best, most diabolical party game we can. First up, mini games. They're great. They've always been great. Just keep doing what you're doing. You'll be fine. Well, you know what? Actually, no, I take that back. Do change one thing. In Super Mario Party, the fact that even if you come in last place in a minigame, you can still get one or two coins is stupid. Purposely throwing a 2v2 minigame because your partner is like one or two spaces away from the star and only needs five more coins to get it is the most baller move in gaming history. Don't ruin it with your participation trophies. Let me end my friendships in a way that would make WWE jealous. Cowards. Another aspect of Super Mario Party that I felt needed some improvement were the items. I'm sorry, but a Dash Mushroom, Poison Mushroom, and Coinado just aren't gonna cut it. Especially considering all the crazy stuff you could do with the candy in Mario Party 8. I want twice, I want thrice, I want we bowling, I want the rock, I want doula- uh, You know what? You know what? Take back everything I just said, I don't care about anything else. Just give me an item that lets me duel my friends and I will be happy. God! That thing was the best! I love you. Let's talk characters. Now, a huge expansive roster in a Mario Party game, not really a big deal breaker for me, so honestly, if you just poured over everyone that was in Super Mario Party, I'll be okay with that. False! Let me play as Toad and Toadette, Nintendo. Please, just let me play as them. You know what? Scrap the entire roster, scrap the whole freaking franchise. Give me Toad Party, where you get to play as the Toad Brigade, Toadette, and no one else. Do it. In most Mario Party games, who you chose didn't really matter at all. It was purely an aesthetic thing. Well, except it determines the taunt that you can spam over and over again on your opponent's turn, which I know, crucial. But. In Super Mario Party, they decided to change all that and give each character their own special dice that you could switch between during the game. Now this was really cool, it gave each character their own sense of individuality, but let's be honest, the fact that some characters' dice are just inarguably better than others is plain unfair and it turns every game into just a fight over who can get Wario on the character select screen. I love it, keep it. 
On that same topic, the ally system in Super Mario Party was completely broken. If you were the first one to get an ally, it basically meant you were moving twice the amount of spaces that your friends were in that game. And that's hilarious, so it gets to stay as well. Similar to the Mario Kart video that I made, making a good Mario Party really isn't all that difficult. Recent games have tried to cram in as much extra stuff and gimmicks and all that as they could, but all it ended up doing was taking away from the part of the game that people actually care about. Super Mario Party had a lot of stuff to do in it, but with only four boards, it just didn't have enough of the stuff that I want to do in it. You want a good Mario Party? Then you best have some good boards in there. Now, I could honestly just end the video right there, but I'll do you one better, Nintendo. I will give you some brilliant, fully fleshed out ideas for all of the boards in this hypothetical new game. All you have to do is write the code, send me some royalty checks when this game starts flying off the shelves, and we'll be good to go. But first, what makes a good board? Well, for me, it's a combination of three things. The first is that it's dynamic. Things happen that change the board and the things you can do as the game progresses. This keeps the game from feeling stale after the first like 15 turns or so. Second, it presents you with a lot of choices. Give me some branching paths, some switches that you can turn on and off to change the board for everyone, and certainly give me a plethora of options to mess with my friends. And third, each board has to feel unique. Now obviously yes, all the boards in every Mario Party game, they always look completely different from one another, but adding in a central mechanic to each individual board that makes it feel completely different from anything else in the game, that keeps it from getting stale, and that's good. So, with all that in mind, Nintendo, here are my board ideas completely free of charge, though again, a few checks would be appreciated. First up, Larry's Ludicrous Lagoon. Yeah, that's right. I know you folks in Nintendo love to cram the Koopalings at every little thing, so here you go. Also, it might encourage you to include more than four boards in the game, but that's all I'll say about that for now. Larry's Ludicrous Lagoon is your classic first Mario Party board in a game. It's uh, set on a tropical island. It's got a couple of branching paths that go through the jungle and along the beach to form one big loop. And it's filled with a bunch of critters that can either help or hinder you as you go. Maybe like Plessy and that weird big purple fish are in the water. When you're on the beach, they can either carry you forward or backwards. In the jungle, there could be those big literal dinosaurs that show up in Mario Kart for whatever reason sometimes. Uh, they could like knock down trees and move boulders and stuff to open and close paths for everyone as you go. And maybe uh, a big blooper is sitting in the titular lagoon and he can like shoot ink at you if you get too close or something. You know, just fun stuff like that. But the main set piece is a big volcano sat in the middle of the island. For the first half of the game, it is completely dormant, just there as a cool little visual thing. But about halfway through the game, every once in a while, it'll start rumbling. And when it does, you've got only one or two turns to take cover or get as far away as you can, lest you get struck by some lava and lose half your coins. This is what I'm talking about, about boards being dynamic. You know, new things happen as you go. Like I said in the beginning, this is your classic first board. You know, it's not too complicated. It's just one loop with a couple of branching paths here and there. Uh, the star moves whenever you get it. You gotta constantly be chasing it. Maybe there's a couple of fun green spaces, but nothing too crazy. You know, just simple, classic. Oh, uh, I'm not totally sure how Larry relates to any of that. I kind of just threw him in for the alliteration. Uh, maybe he's just sitting uh, on the beach sipping a sipping a latte or something. I don't know. Iggy's Eerie Estate. I know, technically, it's not alliterative like all the rest, but I did my best. Get off my back. In this one, you... Look, I'm gonna be completely honest, it's literally just King Boo's Haunted Hideaway from Mario Party 8 again. That is the single greatest board that has ever been made in any Mario Party game. There is not a single thing you can say that would change my mind. No, for all you whiny babies out there who never played Mario Party 8 because some of the minigames force you to, God forbid, shake the Wii Remote around a little bit, gone are the days of actual good Mario Party where the minigames force you to move the control stick around a little bit and you had to buy a separate glove from Nintendo lest you get blisters on the palm of your hand. I am bad at motion controls, therefore motion controls are bad. Get good, lad. <sighs> what was I talking about again? 
The beauty of King Boo's Haunted Hideaway is that it was completely randomized every time you played. You and your friends would move through this mansion, uncovering the map as you went like Metroid or something, trying to be the first to get to the hidden star room without running into one of the dreaded pitfalls and getting sent all the way back to the beginning. This board was so great because it literally cannot possibly get old. It is completely new every single time, and I say screw it, just do it again. Maybe to differentiate itself a little bit, instead of having the mansion completely reset every time someone finds a star, just have the star move to a new unexplored part of the mansion and maybe like some doors move around and like unlock and stuff. And so instead of just exploring a new mansion every single time, it's one big map that just keeps expanding and looping around back on itself like a Resident Evil game. Tell me that wouldn't be the coolest thing in the world. Aside from that, just throw in a myriad of haunted house themed events. You know, you got like your hidden passageways behind fireplaces, maybe like some ghostly action where you can teleport to a different part of the mansion. And of course, who could forget the pitfalls that warp you all the way back to the beginning dotted throughout this randomly generated masterpiece. Five years after this game has come out and you and your buds have played every single board to death, I can guarantee that this is the board you'll keep coming back to. Next up is the only lady of the Koopalin crew, so you better show her some respect. It is Wendy's Wacky Wharf. Now this is another maritime board, but unlike the tropical setting of Larry's Ludicrous Lagoon, this one is set on a big pier and boardwalk. This is another classic Mario Party board. You know, you race the star and then it moves to another random space every time someone picks it up. But the main gimmick here is a bunch of ships constantly moving around the board that you can stop at every single time you pass one. Some of them are merchant ships. You go aboard, you buy some items, you're on your way. Others are transportation. They can take you to another part of the board in a flash for a hefty fee, of course. And then halfway through the game, you might start running into the dreaded pirate ship, sometimes disguised as regular ships. Run into one of these bad boys, and they'll start stealing your coins, items, and even stars. That is, unless you have enough gold to cough up to go stick them on one of your friends instead. Better not make any enemies when playing this board, lest you be running for your life for the entire game from some swashbuckling thieves that your friends hired. Next up is Morton's Malicious Market. Morton's Malicious Market is a stock market themed board set in a big city. Do you remember Fortune Street, that weird Mario cross Dragon Quest cross capitalism game that came out for the GameCube? It's kind of like that. On this board, stars are super expensive, so you gotta find a way to make a lot of money and make it fast. And to do that, you can invest your own money on certain items or spaces or something like that. And every time someone uses that item or lands on that space, you get some money back. I can already see the strategies forming, the social politics brewing. Maybe like Luigi has invested a ton of money into the thrice item and he makes bank every time someone uses one. But you gotta guarantee that you make it to the star before Birder does so you can send it to the opposite side of the board. Do you bite the bullet and use the item or do you keep Luigi's pockets empty and hope for the best? Oh, I can feel the friendship shattering before me and it feels good. All right, here we go, board number five. See Super Mario Party? It wasn't that hard. All aboard, get your tickets ready because this next one is Roy's Radical Railway. This one's pretty simple, just a long straight path, maybe a couple forks here and there that come back together and up to three stars waiting for you at the end. Once you get to the end of this track, you best hope your pockets are stuffed because you buy as many stars as you can while you're there and then it's all the way back to the beginning with you. Seems simple, but they don't call this a railway for nothing. Dotted throughout the board are several train cars that lie on top of the track. You can climb up and over them and there's more spaces on top as you make your way to the end. And throughout the board there are several spaces that let you move a car of your choice a distance of your choice. Maybe you send the car that you're currently standing on top of way forward to give yourself a big boost. Or you send one of the cars that your friend is on top of way back. Maybe you can purposely run other people over and cause them to lose a bunch of coins. Or purposely stop the train car on top of like the ally space that your friend is about to use that custom dice to get. 
or maybe you just went left at the fort and you send that train to the right so that your friends can't run you over. The strategies are just endless and I love it. Next up, Lemmy's Lethal Library. I'm gonna be honest, uh, I don't got a whole lot of stuff to say about this one. I, uh, I just couldn't think of anything else alliterative, so here we are. This one is a labyrinth of library bookshelves. You can run around in between them or there are certain areas where you can get up on top. There are items that can like move the bookshelves around to close certain pathways and open other ones. And then maybe you can like shake the shelf next to you on the ground and knock anyone else who's on top of it off back down to the ground. That's all I got. Look, there are three Koopalings that start with L. Cut me some slack. And rounding out the Koopa Kid extravaganza is Ludwig's Lunar Landing. You ever seen the movie Alien? Picture that, but instead of a terrifying xenomorph, it's this blue-haired weirdo. This board is set on a mysterious space station with a whole bunch of different rooms and areas and stuff to unlock, you know, doors to open and close, all your classic stuff. But the real fun of this comes from the fact that at the beginning of every single game, Ludwig will stick one of the bosses from Super Mario Galaxy on you, and each boss acts completely different, and it's totally random which one you get. So maybe Dino Piranha will just rampage through the station, destroying everything in his path as he tries to run you down, while Major Burroughs stealthily sneaks under the ground, only leaving minor traces of where he's been and where he's going. And Boulder Guys could possess the very station itself, opening and closing doors, turning on and off lights at will to ensnare you in its trap. But regardless of which boss is running you down, one thing's for certain. If they catch you, it's going to be a bad time and you're going to kiss those stars goodbye. So here, you're still fighting all your friends tooth and nail to try and get to those stars first, but also this time, you have a shared common enemy. Will this result in unexpected alliances or even more brutal betrayals? Probably the second one, let's be honest, people are terrible. I would totally lock my friend in a room with the big boss and listen as they just get eaten alive. Oh. Bliss. Similar to Iggy's Eerie Estate, the fact that you can get a different boss every single time you play would keep the board from getting stale even on repeat playthroughs, which is essential. And last but not least, the granddaddy board of them all, Bowser Jr's Big Bad Beastiary. This is your classic final board in a Mario Party game. Unfair, unrelenting, borderline unplayable, but so much fun. Papa Bowser isn't home, and so Junior decided to steal his daddy's credit card and buy a whole bunch of monsters that are now running rampant through the castle. These guys have one job and one job alone. Make your life a living hell. You know those Mario Maker levels that were clearly designed by a nine-year-old in like three minutes? They just went to the enemies tab and just kind of went nuts and then called it a day? I'm thinking something kind of like that. Actually, you know what, Nintendo? If you could like hire a nine-year-old to just slap on the keyboard for a while while making this level, just, you know, just have them code the whole thing, that'd probably be for the best. And with those eight boards and a bunch of fun mini games that I'm not going to describe all of them because I don't got enough time, that's all you need for a good Mario Party game. I've got a couple of other board ideas for like a Bowser's Barbecue one, maybe a Camilla's Castle, but those will cost extra Nintendo if you want some DLC ideas. But I believe with that, I will bring this wish list to a close. But before I end the video, just know that these are just harmless wishes. They're not expectations, they're not demands. If these aren't in the next Mario Party game, I'm not gonna just immediately write it off have an open mind, you know, maybe, perhaps, the people who make video games for a living might be able to come up with better ideas than me. Unlikely, but you know, it's possible. So with that, I will bring this video to a close. Uh, if you like the video, you can like, comment, subscribe. I feel like I don't say that a lot. I probably should. I'm good at YouTubing. So I will see you all in whatever video you decide to watch next. Uh, the new episodes of the Chip Tide Show come out every two weeks, so you just gotta stick around a little bit and there will be some new goodness. Uh, and if you have any ideas for uh, future episodes of the Chip Tide Show that you would want me to do, throw them in the comments down below. I'll take a look. Maybe I'll be inspired to do it. But I will see you all then. But until then, don't forget to take it easy.